Good morning. And welcome. I'm Carol Plumley, Oversight Treasurer and member of the board at the Unitarian Universalist Church in Reston. Whether you are on Zoom or here in the church sanctuary, we are so glad you are with us here this morning. No matter how old or how young you are, wherever you are in your spiritual journey, however you identify and whomever you love, know you are welcome here. We have a couple of announcements this morning. Reverend Scott. <laughs> Here I was just enjoying your sonorous voice and good morning. Our capital campaign for the future of this congregation is underway. You all should have received or will receive in the next day or so, not today because there's no mail on Sunday, a mailing that explains the capital drive. On Friday, we sent out frequently asked questions with hopefully clear answers. If you do have any questions about the capital campaign, Holly, our president, Holly, stand up, please, is here and as am I. I can report to you that in the first week of the campaign, we've received a few gifts and we're already more than one quarter of our goal. We have raised over $50,000 of the 180,000 we are driving to get. So please uh, consider filling out the commitment card. It's also online. You'll be receiving that again uh, in email. And you know the greatest participation we can receive from you is, is if everyone can participate, that's great. What I often say about capital campaigns is gifts to capital campaigns come out of our savings or our legacy giving, not out of our weekly or daily or yearly operating account where we manage our personal finances, capital campaign gifts tend to come out of savings and other sources of income. So that's, uh, that's an important thing for you to realize. Welcome all of you this Sunday. And now we have one more announcement. Randy, we're having a, we're having a ministerial search. We are indeed. Hopefully oh, many of you recognize these. Oh, you don't mind? No. Yeah. So we've been asking you to fill out surveys for the last month or so. Now is the deadline. This is the last day to get your information included in our survey so that we can know exactly, or we can portray to the ministers exactly what our congregation is like, and we can get a better sense of what it is our congregation needs in the way of a minister. So get those surveys in today. There's links, um, QR codes, paper copies, Anybody who has a, a ministerial search badge ribbon has extra paper copies if you need them today. Get those in. Also, we're beginning the signups for the cottage meetings. They're on the wall in the uh, East Foyer. Um, please sign up. It's a good way to connect with other people and share the information that we've gotten from the surveys um, <clears throat> and just better get our understanding of what it is that everybody's looking for. Um, and one last thing, uh, on October 8th, there will be a Beyond Categorical Thinking Workshop that is important also to make sure that our congregation is ready to welcome whoever it is that we feel is the best minister for our congregation, regardless of what they may be like. Um, you know, not everybody's going to be like um, our current reverend. Um, you know, we need to make sure that we are also ready for that so make sure to mark your calendars for that. It'll be in the morning, Saturday, October 8th. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Uh, now let us center ourselves for worship. Please take some deep quieting breaths with me. And let us enter our time of worship together as we listen to La Fille à Cheveux de Long, which translates as The Girl with the Flaxen Hair by Claude de Bousset, and performed by our guest accompanist, Catherine Grimble.
Our opening words come from famous Unitarian Universalist minister, uh, Gordon McKeeman. We summon ourselves this hour from the demands and the delights of our daily rounds, from the dirty dishes and the unwaxed floors, from the unmowed grass and untrimmed bushes, from all the incompletenesses and not yet startednesses, from the unholy and all that is unresolved, we summon ourselves this hour to attend to our vision of peace and justice, of cleanliness and health, of delight and devotion, of the lovely and the holy, of who we are and what we can do. We summon the power of tradition and the exhilaration of newness, the wisdom of the ages and the knowing of the very young. We summon beauty this hour, eloquence, poetry and music to be the bearer of our dreams. We this hour would open our eyes, our ears, our minds, our hearts to the amplest dimensions of life. It is good to be together. Morning has broken. Yes, our opening hymn this morning is Morning Has Broken, which is number 38 in your gray hymnal. It's also written, the words are written on the back of your order of service, if you'd prefer. And if you're joining us online, the words will appear um, in your chat box. Is it in the chat box anymore? It is. Yes, sorry. Yeah, it's in the chat box. Please rise as you are able in body or spirit and join me in singing. Morning has broken like the first morning. Blackbird has spoken like the first bird. Praise for the singing. Praise for the morning. Praise for the Today's chalice lighting words are entitled Open to Unexpected Answers, written by Julianne Lepp. A large gray rock is cracked down the middle where many small colorful stones are caught. We seek our place in the world. Mike's, okay. We seek our place in the world and the answers to our heart's deepest questions. As we seek, may our hearts be open to unexpected answers. May the light of our chalice remind us that this is a community of warmth, of wisdom, and of welcoming multiple truths. Thank you, Bob. Welcoming 
multiple truths that is one of the best things we do here on Sunday mornings. Every week, our church intentionally recommits to each other by singing our covenant together. If you are new or visiting us, please hear these words as our blessing to you. Before I do the time for all ages, because Linda Weaver unfortunately came down with COVID day before yesterday, she's at home and doing well. It's as most of the cases these days mild, she's doing just fine. So you're gonna have to put up with my theatrics such as they are. I wanted to mention that I will be working uh, remotely this week from Vero Beach, Florida. Our condominium down there was turned upside down with uh, a complete re-plumbing of the building. And so with 11 holes punched in our walls, we need to kind of go back and re our our condominium there. So I'll be working remotely this week, but we'll be back the following Sunday, next Sunday. Uh, next Sunday I won't be here, but the following Sunday I will. So our story today, for Time for All Ages, is based on cooking together Trinidad style, a traditional story retold by Faye Morganson in Ancient Stories for Modern Times. It seems that long ago, the ports of Trinidad were filled with various uh, tall sailing ships. The local Carib and Arawak people weren't sure what to make of all these foreigners. Some had sailed from Britain and others from France and Spain. The new arrivals included people from China and India, Ghana and Mali. They came from Syria, Portugal and Venezuela too. Each of the groups arrived on the shores of Trinidad with their own language, their own songs, their own clothing and food, different from each other and definitely different from the people, the native people who had lived on the island for many generations. People are people who are most comfortable with what we know. So even though Trinidad is not a very big place, people stuck close to their own kind. The Arawaks and the Caribs were treated into the forests. The Chinese avoided the French, who avoided the Indians, who mixed as little as possible as they could with the Venezuelans. And down on the line, Trinidad was a terribly divided nation. Well, things might have well stayed that way, but one rainy season, a hurricane made a terrible mess of Trinidad. Crops were drowned, houses flattened, trees uprooted, and boats smashed. The people were scared and hungry, and they hoarded food for themselves and their own tribe. The island was more divided after the hurricane than ever. And it might well have stayed that way, but for an elderly woman who happened to notice something glinting beneath the ruins of a house, she pushed the debris aside and pulled out a huge cooking pot. And she began to hatch a plan. A big smile came over her face. She lit a fire, filled the pot with water, added some salt, and began to stir and chant. It may be a little bland, she chanted, but the soup I'm cooking is for every child and adult. Her chanting was heard far and wide, and people grew curious. It might be a little bland, but the soup I'm cooking is for every child and adult? No one wanted a soup that was bland. Those who heard hurried home and searched through their own store of goods. A Carib family arrived at the square with sweet cocoa plums and starchy cocoa yams. The, minister, the woman smiled as they peeled and plucked them into the pot. An Arawak family followed suit with fine bud peppers and slices of sweet squash. A family from Mali brought bunches of green okra pods. An Indian family poured some sweet coconut milk in. Syrians added cumin 
while the Spanish and French came with garlic and onions and thyme. A Chinese family contributed a big green leaf of dasheen that gave the soup a beautiful deep green color. Soon, the aroma from the pot caused people to smile. The smart woman stirred. Her soup was almost finished. She paused for a few moments, curious about the clamor of the children she could hear from down at the beach. A short time later, later a big giggling mixed group arrived of all colors and shapes and human sizes. They'd been too busy helping each other capture crabs to pay any attention to their cultural differences. They had buckets of full, rich tasting blue crabs to add to the soup. The smart woman stirred. At last she announced the first Kalaloo soup. The old woman ladled out scoop after scoop of the mysterious mixed flavored soup into people's bowls and cups. It was, as you can imagine, delicious and hearty. Once their bellies were full, they began to talk amongst themselves and tell stories. They began to sing. And the cultural divisions began breaking down. It said, the story ends, that the children who made the first Kalaloo soup continued after this to mix and mingle with one another. It is said that their children were the Kalaloo children, children who knew how to get along with people of all cultures, all colors, all shapes, all cuisines, all sizes. And then Linda asks in her script, I wonder how we might be like the Kalaloo children and continually learn from those around us. So we want to sing our children off to their classes and thank them for being with us this morning. words that we sing are on the back of your order of service if you'd like to join us. testimonial to give. Linda asked me if I would give a testimonial about volunteering with our religious education program. And I have been volunteering with RE for many years since Eleanor was uh, inside of me. I was teaching downstairs, very pregnant. Uh, and I remember Zia and um, teaching her when she was like in first grade and now she's like taller than I am. So we are starting a new year here and coming out of the pandemic and things have changed and we've got new folks and we're remembering how to do these things that we used to do right um, and what we need is definitely some more volunteers to work with our children they are an amazing energy to be around and if you feel like you have something to offer which i'm sure each and every one of you does have something to offer our children we would so appreciate your volunteering for our re program we have first uh kindergartners preschoolers through fifth grade that meet downstairs there are a couple of different age groups as well and it's on sunday mornings um and you know being with the kids is really rewarding and if you're not around kids as much as I am these days, <laughs> you might really benefit from the experience. I think it's a wonderful experience to be with our young people and to learn from them. And while we do our best to try and impart some wisdom of our own from our own unique experiences to them. So if you find that you have some time, some interest, some energy, um, and some desire to work with our children, please come talk with me after service. Or Devin, Devin, stand up, please. Devin is the head of our RE committee. 
please speak with uh, Devin or myself and we'll get you signed up and ready to work with our wonderful young people. Thank you. As Cara mentioned, we are coming out of COVID. Just so you know, we're about 70 people now live every Sunday, and we have about 45 households <laughs> dialing in. So probably on any Sunday, just so you know, we're probably about 130, 40 people, 140 people attending worship. And we'll always have now a hybrid congregation, but it's so good to see us back in, in full vibrancy, and not full vibrancy, we still have many people who need to get, get re-engaged, and they will over the coming weeks and months. Also, as I mentioned to you this week uh, by email, please get your new vaccine, your new super booster, uh, which is good for the, the new variants that have come along, and even in the, the, this, this vaccine anticipates any new virus variations that may come. So don't hesitate to go to your CVS or Walgreens or Wegmans and get that shot. Um, every week we pause and do joys and sorrows so that no one has to hold them alone. And if you are joining us remotely, which some 45 households are, if you wish to light a real or a virtual candle where you are to remind you of what is on your hearts, please do so. And if those at home wish to share whatever there's on, is on their heart, in the chat, the Zoom chat, you may do so, but remember that that is public. Uh, and those at home may be reading then one another's joys and sorrows as those here with us this morning come forward, those who wish, and take a stone for every joy or sorrow that they have and place it in the bowl of love which holds so much of our concern for the world and others. And if you wish to take a dry stone from around the bowl to take home with you, to remember what's on your heart this week, please do so. May our ritual begin. be one in spirit, spirit of life and love that so faithfully animates this world. We are grateful for this community, which is with us in both times of joy and sorrow. And we hold in our hearts this morning all who are facing any human hardship or difficulty, those who are grieving loss of someone near and dear to them, facing illness or disability in themselves or those around them. In particular, this morning, we have several prayers. 
Danielle McGuinn, our um, bookkeeper, had a collapsed lung and she was in the hospital. She is home and doing better, but her recovery will be long and slow. And we send all of our love to Danielle and her husband who's taking care of her. And yesterday we had a beautiful memorial service for a remarkable guy, Jerry Bonas, and our love goes out to Bunny, his widow. They had a big party here. Uh, did they not, Claire, after, after the memorial service for a really exceptional presence in our Reston community? Also, Eileen Rohr's cousin Arnuf, uh, who is a good Austrian, condolences to, to our family in Switzerland. Uh, he died this week, and uh, we send all of our love to that entire family. Whether shared this morning or held silently in our hearts, may our joys be multiplied in community, and may all gathered here find this hour comfort and calm. Now is the time for the offering. As a self-funded church, UUCR relies on the generosity of its members and friends to fund daily operations to ensure that the church and its resources are here for us and others. Now and in the future, pledges support our worship and music programs, our religious education program, programs for members and friends, community outreach, and connections to Unitarian Universalism. We now invite you to support the work of UU Reston by making our donation to the collection plate if you are here in the sanctuary or at the link on the slide and in the chat box. Thank you for your generosity and support of our beloved spiritual home. Thank you, Catherine. So this morning, I begin my autumn blockbuster sermon series that you've all been waiting for. The five smooth stones of religious liberalism. I have the stones up here marked, and I'll go through that and explain each of them to you. Um, it, this is inspired by the work of the Reverend Dr. James Luther Adams. Do we have that slide? James Luther Adams. The famous quote about him, in James Luther Adams, one finds the curious and sometimes contradictory combination of medieval saint, Renaissance humanist, Marxist critic, Enlightenment encyclopedist, sectarian enthusiast, and bourgeois compulsive. I have no idea what a bourgeois compulsive is. 
but that's what his editor called him. Dr. Adams, after abandoning his family's fundamentalist back Baptist background, became a UU parish minister in Salem, Massachusetts, in the building that is now the Witch Museum. If you've been to Salem, Massachusetts, it was the third or fourth Unitarian church of that town. Anyway, he was a longtime divinity school professor at Harvard and is widely recognized, as Wikipedia puts it, as, quote, the most influential theologian among American Unitarian Universalists in the 20th century. And uh, more simply put, James Luther Adams was a brilliant and very gentle man who wrote and spoke widely about UU thought and practice in his best remembered book from 1976 on being human religiously. There's my copy and there's a jacket of that book, um, which to this day is used by many UUs striving to understand what sets liberal religion apart from fundamentalist or orthodox religious traditions. Now, this image of the five smooth stones has a bit of an edge to it, for it comes from those of you who know your Bible story from the Old Testament story of David and Goliath, not a peaceful story. I'm just, you all know the story from your Sunday school years. It's told in 1 Samuel, one of the earliest books of Jewish scripture that describes frequently in allegorical terms, the history of Israel and his people. In this account, it seems the Philistine army had gathered for war against the army of Israel. And the two armies faced each other across a, a steep valley. A Philistine giant by the name of Goliath, measuring over nine feet tall, the story tells us, and wearing full armor came out each day for 40 days mocking and challenging the Israelis to fight. Saul, the king of Israel and his whole army were frankly terrified by Goliath he being so big. But one day David, who was probably just a teenager at the time, was on the battlefront and heard Goliath shouting his defiance, and he saw a great fear in the army behind him. David responded, who is this Philistine that should defy the armies of God? So David volunteered to King Saul to go fight Goliath without a shield or armor, mind you. David went to a nearby stream and picked up five smooth stones, which he put in his bag and went off to face this fierce and towering enemy. When Goliath saw little David without armor and apparently without a chance in the confrontation, he mocked and ridiculed the skinny teenager. But as Goliath moved in for the sure kill, David reached into his bag and used a stone to fling one of the stones at Goliath's head. Finding luckily a gap in the armor, the stroke, the stone sank into the giant's forehead and he fell down to the ground. David then rushed forward and used the giant's own sword to kill him. This is not a sweet story. When the Philistines saw that their gigantic hero was dead at the hands of a boy, nonetheless, they turned and ran. And thus it is in ancient Jewish history tells us, probably fancifully, that David saved the Israelis from a terrible defeat. Now this is a very violent story, so it's curious that gentle Dr. Adams, this learned man, decided to, to use this militaristic biblical story uh, about David slaying Goliath to frame in and affirm what he believed to be the five central tenets of liberal faith. Could he possibly have meant that the Unitarian Universalists who many believe is kind of like a 97 pound weakling in the denominational world, that are we, uh, we're very small and some would say very insignificant like David, could he possibly have meant that these five stones of ours will slay fundamentalism, slay religious orthodoxy with their clarity and purpose? Well, at least Dr. Adams seemed to have believed that these five smooth stones were our, dare I say, our best weapons for the battle of the hearts and the minds of religious people everywhere. Still, I'm amused that this militaristic image is used to frame in our peaceable principles as you use. So here are the five smooth stones of liberalism. First, 
learn. Revelation is unsealed. We must always be learning new truths. That is Adam's point. We must always be learning new truths. The second stone, respect. And I'll do this in two weeks. We must be in right relationship with one another with free consent and no coercion in matters of spirituality or faith. Three, give. We are morally obliged, Adam said, to seek and work for a just and loving community and world. We must be a prophetic voice in society. Four, work. It is people who make good things happen. Nothing is going to happen magically. Good must be consciously given form and power within our lives and within history. And the final fifth stone, hope. We must strive for an attitude of ultimate optimism. We must live in hope. So these are the five stones that I'll be covering between now and the end of October. So we'll be visiting each of these. And the first one is learn. That is our first stone today, learn. Learn because revelation, as Adams puts it, is not sealed. All right, now it's very interesting that Adams begins the five stone uh, nomenclature with this particular stone, which is the epistemological or methodological stone of our faith. An Episcopal, uh, uh, the epistemological or methodological stone. Uh, next slide. Oh, there it is. Learn. Revelation is continuous. Meaning has not yet been finally captured. Nothing is complete. Nothing is exempt, Adams writes, from criticism. There is always something new to learn. Our religious tradition is a living tradition because we are always learning new truths. This is an epistemological methodology, a big word, epistemology, fancy philosophical term and theological term which asks what is one's authority for knowledge, for truth, and for goodness. I've said this before from the pulpit, that epistemology, how you go about finding truth, is perhaps the most foundational question in religion. By what authority, by what sources of truth and reality and meaning do you personally say something is real and true and right? How do you navigate your way through the world knowing what is true and right? From what authoritative sources or reliable methodologies are truth and meaning revealed and made known to you? These are the epistemological questions. Now, all religions, liberal and conservative ones, must answer this knowledge and authority question before they proceed with the particulars of their faith. All religions need to articulate how their truths and meanings are made known and revealed. Now, I think as most of you understand, most of our Christian neighbors, especially those from Orthodox or traditional traditions, say something like this epistemologically. Here's the traditional, uh, next slide. The authority for the truth and validity of my Christianity comes once and for all revealed from the word of God as recorded in the books of the Bible and from the teachings of Jesus, which are also set down once and for all in the Bible. So for most traditional Christians, religious and theological and ethical truth and meaning are revealed once and for all. You've all heard about the old bumper sticker, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it. This is not a Unitarian Universalist approach. People who put that slogan on their bumpers are saying that they believe that God's eternal truths are sealed and revealed and established once and for all, for all time, for all believers through all time. But Dr. Adams affirmed that the first and most arguably smooth stone of our tradition is the contrary epistemological assertion that revelation, 
meaning truth, is not sealed, but is in fact radically open. And therefore, it is continuously unfolding in new and fresh and sometimes surprising ways. I return again to the words of Dr. Adams. Religious liberalism depends on the first principle that revelation is continuous, meaning has not been finally captured. Nothing is complete, and this, thus nothing is exempt from criticism and evaluation. Now, Adams's assertion about revelation as being unsealed and therefore constantly unfolding makes sense when you understand how Adams defined God. He was a liberal Christian, so this is his God concept. God, next slide, is that inescapable commanding reality which ultimately concerns humanity that sustains and transforms all meaningful existence. No Christian fundamentalist will really understand or approve of that definition. But what Adams was saying is that God is not some ancient fixed reality or presence sitting on a permanent throne somewhere, but is rather a living, fluid, dynamic reality in the world, swirling through humanity and history. And it is constantly, therefore, being revealed and created in new forms. I quote him again, we must depend on a transforming reality, God, that breaks through encrusted forms of life and thought to create new forms. We religious liberals put our faith in a creative reality that is recreative. Revelation, therefore, is continuous. And thus it is that mild-mannered, little wimpy old Harvard professor, James Luther Adams, who weighed about 120 pounds, threw his first stone right at the head of orthodoxy, if you will. He's saying, you religious conservatives say the truth and revelation are sealed, fixed, frozen once and for all in scripture and tradition. But we say, we say that truth in this obviously dynamic and fluid world of ours that, reflect, that reflects the nature of God, that truth is being constantly recreated and discovered in ever new and ever creative forms and expressions. And then he says, as life inexorably, this is a paraphrase, as life inexorably moves forward on this planet, we Unitarian Universalists keep our hearts and our minds and our spirit radically open to new truths and new discoveries about both the divine and the human as they constantly unfold for us to see and utilize. Now, let me be very clear here. Dr. Adams is not saying that there is no truth revealed in ancient scriptures or the prophets of old, their teachings or church tradition. He is just denying in a dynamic and changeable world such as ours that religion and spiritual, religious and spiritual truth can never be fixed and frozen for all time. And this open-ended and fluid epistemological approach to religious and ethical truth of ours, this insistent affirmation that Adams makes that revelation is continuous, not sealed, uh, is perfectly reflected in the sources section of our UU denominational bylaws. In addition to our seven principles, we have six sources written down that guide us epistemologically as we seek truth, and here they are. The first is the most important. Next slide. Direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to renew to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. So the first authority you have in your religious journey is your own head, your own conscience, your own mind, your own intuition and spirit. First, trust yourself. But then we go on to look at other sources of truth. We're not just focused on the individual. The second is 
words and deeds of prophetic women and men who challenge us to confront powers and structures of evil with justice, compassion, and the transforming power of love. This is what Jesus did, even though most of his followers in the traditional church don't get it at all. As Scott Gerson said last week, and we'll talk about this more at Christmas, Christians should be horrified by Trumpism, and yet they seem to embrace it. They're missing the whole point. Pay attention to the words and deeds of prophetic men and women. The third, wisdom from the world's religions which inspire us in our ethical and spiritual life. All the great scriptures of human history can teach us. The Ten Commandments don't have much wrong, okay? Nor do the ethical edicts of the Quran or the Bhagavad Gita or Taoist scripture. Okay, the fourth source, because we did flow out of Judeo-Christian heritage, Jewish and Christian teachings which call us to respond to God's love by loving our neighbors as ourselves. This is self-evident. This is the core of our Judeo-Christian heritage. And we, we, we add that in addition to the prophetic men and women because we flow out of the specific Judeo-Christian tradition. This, the fifth source, humanist teachings, which grabbed a hold of Unitarianism and Universalism at about the turn of the last century, counsel us to heed the guidance of reason and the results of science and the war and warn us against the idolatries of mind and spirit. And finally, spiritual teachings of earth-centered traditions, which is paganism and other spiritual sources that have existed for centuries, which celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. And next Sunday, our pagan uh, chapter here is going to be presenting you a, a service on autumnal spiritual teachings. Don't miss next week. So as we you use search for truth and meaning, we go to all six of these sources. And we have a much, therefore, wider and more open, fluid epistemology than, say, our Orthodox Christian or Jewish or even Muslim neighbors, which, who depend on ancient scriptures to reveal the fixed truths of their faith. And by the way, every great world religion traditions has fundamentalists who believe in fixed truth and more liberal people who believe more like uh, Adams did that God and the realities of life are fluid and changing and Islam, like all the other religions, must change and evolve from some ancient cruelties. As we've already said, we see and appreciate the wisdom found in ancient scriptures, but we cannot stop there. So Dr. Adams was right, in my view, to list this smooth stone, learn, as the first and foremost dimension of our spirituality, of our religious quest, our epistemology. Let me see if I can demonstrate this open-ended epistemological principle in concrete terms. When I entered the ministry in 1974, I've almost been at this 50 years, one of the favorite sayings of Unitarian Universalists is, if, next slide, if we had a Unitarian Universalist Bible, it would be a loose leaf binder. Oh, I seem to have one of those right here. Look at that, how convenient. How, how does this work? Let me demonstrate. I had fun making this up. I had to go to Target to get paper with punch holes in it. Anyway, here is an image of the traditional King James Bible. On my bookshelf at home in New York, I have as a family heirloom my devout Missouri Synod Lutheran grandmother's well-worn 120-year-old copy. She had little notes in the margins. It was her Bible, which I am sure, her name was Frida Ewing, faithfully and regularly read. It was so worn when I got it after her death. And from conversations I had with her, I'm sure she believed that within the gilded pages of that book were all the spiritual truths 
revealed once and for all that she would ever need to live a righteous and faithful and wise and responsible life. But here is what my Bible might look like. Unlike my grandmother's King James, it is a constantly evolving and changing document that I use to guide myself on my religious journey. Now the way this works is that when I find a passage, say from ancient scripture, that no longer makes any ethical or moral sense to me, I simply take it out. Well, let me give you an example. Here is something from uh, 1 Corinthians 13. Kara, you'll find this interesting. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, also saith the law. Well, I don't want that in my Bible. Now, how many of you like shrimp and crab? Would you raise your hand? Here's something from Leviticus. Is an abomination before the Lord to eat shellfish, for that which hath no fins or scales that who has fins or scales, you may not eat, for it is unclean unto you. The reason this is in Leviticus is that they had no refrigerators, and people got sick from eating crabs and shrimp and clams, so they outlawed it once and for all. Well, this is a part of the Bible I don't need. I've got a refrigerator at home. How many of you have refrigerators? All right, eating shrimp is not an abomination by God. But then I also find, then I find things in my life that I want to add to my Bible. Here's one. Uh, the Dalai Lama, he's the, to me one of the greatest sources of, of truth. He wrote in his, in his book, um, I forget what it's called, Ethics for the 21st Century. He said, we human beings cannot escape the necessity for love and compassion. This then is my true religion, my simple faith. In this sense, there is no need for a temple or church, for a mosque or synagogue, no need for complicated philosophy, doctrine or dogma. Our own heart, our own mind, he writes, is the temple. The doctrine is compassion, love for others and respect for their rights and dignity, no matter who or what they are. Ultimately, these, he writes, are all that we need so long as we practice these in our daily lives, whether we believe in Buddha or God or follow some other religion or none at all, as long as we have compassion for others and conduct ourselves with restraint out of a sense of responsibility, there is no doubt we will be happy. This goes in my Bible. And then there's my favorite, favorite quote from American poet oh, Carl Sandburg, who when he died up in Raleigh, or I should say Asheville, it was done at, the, at a Unitarian Universalist church. He once wrote at the very end of his collected poems, there is only one horse in the world and the horse's name is all horses. There's only one bird in the air and her name is all wings. There's only one fish in the sea and that fish's name is all fins. There is only one man in the world and his name is all men. There's only one woman in the world and her name is all women. There's only one child in the world and the child's name is all children. There is only one maker in the world and that, that maker's children cover the earth and they are called all God's children. That goes in my Bible, that universalist sentiment that must guide us every day. So there's my loose leaf Bible, my friends, and you're free to get one of your own. Just buy a binder and start adding things to it. You laugh, it's really that simple. <laughs> All right, I skipped a, I'm skipping ahead for myself here. All right, now I'm caught up. I think you get the idea here. For all of us Unitarian Universalists, scripture, like all truth, is a fluid, 
evolving, dynamic, multifaceted reality like a diamond. The following is projected up. Next slide. The first smooth stone of religious liberalism is that to learn. Revelation is not sealed. Revelation is continuous. Meaning has not been finally captured. Nothing is complete. Nothing is exempt from criticism. There is always something new to learn. Our religious tradition, Adams writes, is a living tradition because we are always learning new truths. This is the epistemological or methodological first stone of liberal religion. So in the middle of the last century, Dr. James Luther Adams rightly affirmed that first and foremost, religious liberals insist when it comes to their religious and spiritual lives, that they're on a constant, daily, open quest for unfolding truths, for new purpose, and for fresh meaning in our fluid and ever-changing world, where even God is an evolving and dynamic reality, we must remain receptive to new revelations wherever they break out and changing understandings. In the last 20 years, how many changing understandings have we had about the future of our planet and human nature? In other words, across humanity's vast and varied landscape, holy scripture is always being written. New prophets are always being born, and helpful truths are unfolding, and new ethical imperatives, things we must do like protecting our creation, are being discovered. While we are never hostile to ancient truths long cherished by the old spiritual traditions of humanity like those found in Grandma Frida's King James Bible, Unitarian Universalists nonetheless are constantly searching for new spiritual insights and religious and ethical insights that will help us lead lives of joy and purpose and responsibility. With this first stone then, the most important foundational stone, Dr. Adams explains the all important how of how we do religion, how we will approach things with an open mind, crucial to helping us get to a useful and authentic religious place of goodness and love. That's all you need to get started. Come back in two weeks for the second installment. <laughs> You'll learn more. Amen. Our closing hymn, Kara. Our closing hymn is number 12 in the gray hymnal. It is also the words are on the back of your order of service. Uh, if you're online, in the, they will be in the chat box. Please rise in body and spirit as you are able and join me in singing, O life that maketh all things new.
And I send you on your way with this thought. Go your ways, dear friend, knowing not the answer to all things, yet seeking always the answer for one more thing than you now know. Be searchers for truth and goodness with your fellow human beings. Be adventurers in the ways untrod. Hold the lamp of discovery high within you, sharing the hope and whatever discoveries may come with those around you. Amen. Go in peace. We now extinguish this chalice. But not the light of hope and truth, the warmth of community, nor the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Our postlude today is another hymn, so please join me in singing it. The words are in the back, on the back of your order of service, and it is number 1058 in the Teal Hymnal. Be ours a religion. Please join me in singing and rise as you are able. our congregants attending worship on Zoom to join us for our virtual Greet Your Neighbor coffee hour today to discuss the service theme and enjoy fellowship with other congregants. The link is in the chat box and will be on a forthcoming slide. Those here in person are invited to join us for coffee or tea and fellowship. We're going to leave the chairs set up as they were at the beginning of the service, so please do not stack the chairs. We hope you will use the chat box as a virtual receiving line to leave a message about your appreciation for the worship service. Uh, go in peace and may the real service begin. <laughs> 